Hi, everyone. My name is Roseanne Hassett. I'm the executive director of TACTA. I'm happy that you can join us tonight for our presentation on underground shelter design. We're delighted to have Sharon Packer with us tonight. Sharon has been on the TACTA Board of Directors for over 20 years. She is an expert in nuclear, nuclear weapons effects, underground shelter design, and civil defense. Sharon has a bachelor's degree in mathematics with a minor in physics and a master's degree in nuclear engineering. I'd like to inform you that our meeting is being recorded for later viewing on our YouTube channel. The link can be found on our website. Also, you should know that nothing in this presentation should be considered legal, medical, or financial advice. The opinions of the viewers can differ considerably and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of TACTA. You should always do your own research and consult with professionals. Please wait until the end of the presentation to ask your questions as Sharon has a lot of information to cover. Feel free to also use the chat feature and we'll do our best to get those questions answered as they come up. With that, I will turn the time over to Sharon. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, we'll just get started real quick. Um, why do we shelter? Well, natural disaster, man-made, all hazards of every kind, major sunstorms, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires, high winds, pandemics, <laughs> you know what it is. <laughs> so if we want to do all hazard sheltering, if we're prepared for nuclear, then we're prepared for all hazards <clears throat> if, if, we, if we place our shelter correctly. So we are prepared in, in a good nuclear shelter for EMP, for terrorist attack, for nuclear war, for home invasion, for anarchy. And so how are we gonna find some expedient sheltering if we don't have a hardened shelter? And so expedient sheltering isn't going to be all hazard sheltering, but for those of you who don't have a shelter or can't afford one right now, let's kind of just talk through it. Um, when I was going to school um, at the university, we had a, a lot of pipe chases between the, the buildings. And so I got down in those pipe ch chases and I took the other engineering students with me and we went all over that campus well underground. And I thought what a perfect place to shield probably from a fairly decent blast as well as a lot of radiation. So look, if you have to find expedient sheltering, kind of think ahead and think, well, where are the tunnels? Where are the pipe chases? Churches often have them under their, uh, under under the churches. Hospitals have uh, corridors and pipe chases between the, the hospital buildings. Schools sometimes do, universities always do. Um, look in uh, the possibility of using basements, mines, caves, subways. And uh, a lot of the countries are using their subways as, uh, as disaster shelters. They prepared their subways for disaster shelters. Uh, culverts, boiler rooms, armories, underground hospital corridors, underground parking garages. There's a lot of places that you can go to get protection. And if you have a basement, you can certainly build some expedient sheltering into that basement by having a really good table. I think we talked about this before and adding shielding on top of those tables and around the table for a period of time. <clears throat> In a safe room, safe rooms uh, really are not designed usually to be an all hazard shelter, but I wanted to talk about them a minute. Now, this is a safe room I built. Um, it's behind this bookshelf. And uh, all this family wanted was just a place to kind of hide in case there was a home invasion. And it's not airtight, so they had plenty of air. But when that bookshelf opens, then they could go into that a uh, fairly large closet. And so if you have a safe room, you wanna make sure that you have a good uh, door some way that is designed into that safe room so people aren't going to, to find it. And uh, I did another one in a, uh, a home. They, they went from their uh, uh, master bedroom through the back wall and, and the back wall of the um, closet just slid open. You couldn't, there's no way you would be able to see that. And it slid open to a, uh, to a circular staircase that went down to their basement and to a little room that was hidden down there. So there's a lot of ways you can, can do a safe room. <clears throat> but all hazard shelters 
need to have glass and radiation protection. They need to have the proper entrances, the proper doors, and they need to have a real good ventilation and air filtration system. They need to have the proper furnishes, furnishings and certainly storage space. And so um, other than sanitation facilities and lightings, that's about everything that's covered, I think, in a good blast and radiation uh, shelter and outside or, or nearby another energy source so that we have an al alternative energy source. So um, we talked about how we get radiation shielding in an expedient shelter, uh, putting water and food over the top, books over the top of our, our table, dirt or sandbags, concrete, concrete blocks. <laughs> so I got that out of, out of order just a little bit, but I did want you to see some of the things you can do for that expedient shelter. Uh, there shelters uh, we can you know we can do concrete shelters and uh, steel shelters of several kinds but concrete shelters have to be have massive amounts of rebar and probably 10 to 12 inches of concrete in all the walls and more so in the ceilings but these this rebar see how it's tied together and every place you turn a corner it has to overlap and tie so that it gives it the uh, concrete wall the ability to move and bend under blast and earthquake mm. um, situations. Uh, this is a small family block shelter. And um, I think FEMA designed this. And if they have the proper entrance, now see this little entrance here, that's not a proper entrance <laughs> because the radiation is going to shine straight down. But if it were over here and came down and then in with a 90 degree turn, this would be a properly uh, design shelter, but uh, a lot of people want to put them outside where they can uh, have uh, space overhead and, and uh, concrete or some kind of a little patio. Concrete shelters, um, sorry about that. You have to be careful when you design them. And uh, I don't know if you can maybe see uh, this whole slide. I, the pictures are kind of in my way, but um, in a one-story home, you've got you've already got a protection factor of about five or ten in that basement. So you need more protection in the ceiling thickness. So for a 15 psi, which is one atmosphere, you would need 14 inches uh, of dirt or of concrete in that ceiling. And a lot of people say, "Well, I've got eight inches." Well, eight inches is not going to do it. So in that eight inch ceiling, they're going to have to get their, their table in there and put further shielding on it for the first two days. Because in two days, you lose a hundredth of the radiation. You, you lose down to a hundredth of the radiation that's left. So in seven hours, you lose 90%. In two days, you lose another 90%. So if they could stay in their little table, under their table for two days, they would be okay if they're having eight inches uh, or 12 inches in a one story. In a two story, they still need about 12 inches for minimum blast of 15 PSI. Now a 45 PSI blast, the home is not going to survive. So they can make it heavier that this whole shelter would have to ride independent of the home. In the walls of a concrete shelter the, uh, on the entrances, you can see this little overhang here and that's to protect against the debris field because all of our doors open to the outside. They rest against the wall. And that's because the blast then would push that heavy door against the wall instead of just against the, um, the mechanism that closes the door. If they're interior to the door, then, um, then the blast can push the door in. So we want the doors on the outside, but then you have to protect against that debris field. So this is the plan view. So we're looking down now on that overhang. On this one, there's a little hall that comes through. Oops, let's go back. It comes through here. And so you would walk in here and then turn a 90 degree turn. And this is covered with concrete. So the debris field might be out here, but this is how you would get in. In Switzerland, the shelters, there are shelters every place, under every hospital, under every school, every theater, every uh, uh, business of every kind. And so they they do have um, uh, the, the uh, entrance comes in and then they turn at the bottom here and go in at an angle. 
So the um, thickness of the shelter shell, again here, if you were outside without anything overhead, that has to be 31 inches for a uh, 31 inches on the side and 22 inches on the top. So that's massively thick if you don't have any dirt shielding. If you have a little dirt shielding, you can see with zero inches of dirt, you'd have to have 22 inches in that ceiling. And uh, if you have 28 inches of earth, then you can get eight inches of, of uh, ceiling concrete, but it has to have some massive rebar to hold up 28 inches of concrete or of earth covering. And on the side walls, if you're buried, if this is in a basement maybe, and, and uh, your side wall, then you should have 10 inches um, on that side wall for uh, a, a good blast protection to hold up that wall. And um, if it's partially underground, they want you to have between 20 and 28 inches. So. 15 PSI, you would have 20 inches. If you're in a heavy blast zone, you would want 28 inches on this wall. And if you're all above ground again, you need to have some massive walls. This is a, a medium-sized concrete shelter that was designed by uh, Andair in Switzerland. But you can see down here, I like this design because it has an airlock. And and uh, many of you will know what an airlock is, but in a chemical biological or if there's heavy fallout, you don't want to contaminate the shelter when you're coming in. So see the blast door opens to the outside. This always remains closed when this one is open. So will you go in, close this door, and then the ventilation from this ventilator will, and this one will positively pressurize, keep this base pressurized, and then we'll pressurize this space because when you came in, you let the pressure go, you let the pressure out, but we want a slightly positive pressure in the shelter. When you're going out again, you open this door, now you've lost your pressure. You're in, and well, you, you haven't lost your pressure yet. This door is closed, but when you come in here, you close the door, now you're at the same pressure. You open this door and the pressure is lost. So you go in and out this way, but when you come back, uh, you're going to have some contamination issues. But if you had to leave for some reason uh, in a chemical, biological, or a fallout situation, the airlock is a very good way to do it. And that's designed into many of the shelters in Switzerland. And many of the shelters that I'm designing now want the airlocks. <clears throat> this has a, a double bunk. And so that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 on that side, probably the same here. So that's a fairly, it's not a huge shelter but it's got a lot of bunk space, a lot of people, and um, and it would be very nice, a very nice shelter for a, a medium-sized shelter. Uh, this is a concrete shelter that we built uh, in, in America. And this is the door that we use, and you can see how it's resting on the outside of that wall. And so the door is, the 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 uh, frame is on the inside, but the door rests on the outside. So the frame and the door have to be poured at the same time that the wall is is poured. And then after that wall and has uh, uh, cured, then the the door itself has poured with concrete. So these would have uh, eight inches uh, eight inches of concrete in them, and they would sit on a ten or a twelve inch wall. This is the door. At in open, um, and you can see how thick that wall is. This is a a a, a device that we can self rescue with, so that we can force it open if there's a little debris on the outside. <laughs> and this is what it looks like when it's closed from the inside. So you can see this this whole thing rests out. The whole door rests outside of the frame. So in steel shelters, they're corrugated steel pipe shelters that have the arch ceiling, and then there are flat top steel shelters. And so um, in, a, in an arch ceiling or, or a flat top either way, every four inches of dirt cover attenuates half of the gamma radiation. And during those first two weeks is gamma that we're concerned about. So every four feet of dirt then can attenuate over a thousand a protection factor of over a thousand. So if you have four inches, that will give you a protection factor of two, which is one half. 
then eight inches would give you a fourth and 12 inches would give you an eighth. And so you add every time you add four inches, you multiply that protection factor. So when you get to 10 inches, you have two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512 and 1024. So you can see between a protection factor of 500 and 1024, it's only four inches. So when you get start getting massive amounts, you can get some really good protection. So a good fallout uh, shelter should have at least four feet of dirt on it or three feet of concrete. Now in this one, you know, we can see that we have massively more and it would have the protection factor in the millions. But these are the shielding materials that you can put overhead. Lead to get a halving is 0.4 inches. Well, a half of an inch of lead is only going to get a protection factor of two. And so lead is very expensive. So it's not a, you know, it's a great attenuator, but lead's dangerous and, and it's very expensive. Steel is the same way. You would need an inch in order to get a protection factor of two. You'd need concrete is 2.4 to three to three inches, depending on what type of concrete you're using. So if it's three inches, then three uh, times 10 is 30. And if you had 10 halvings, 30 inches of concrete would give you a protection factor of a thousand. Soil is four inches. So four times 10 is 40 inches of concrete would give you a protection factor of over a thousand. Water is not so good, but it's certainly not bad. Wood is 11 inches. And so in our new journal that's just coming out, one of our, um, one of our readers, one of our members, designed a water shelter out of water bricks or water barrels. And so you'll, I think you'll find it interesting to, to read that article. Uh, blast protection. Now in an arch shelter, shelter, you can get 150 PSI protection. So that that is, you're protected within a quarter mile of the crater edge of a one megaton blast. You're still part of the fireball. And so that would be a very heavy blast area, but you would survive in, in uh, this if it's done correctly. So you have to put crushed rock all the way around it. And then uh, we, we like to put an engineer's fill over that and then the topsoil to the grade. And so you have to <clears throat> have a diameter doubled. So if you had a 10 foot shelter, you'd want 10 foot of dirt to get the maximum blast protection. If you have an eight foot shelter, you have eight foot and eight foot of dirt to get that protection. We're showing a lot of little seven foot shelters now. People are buying the seven foot corrugated steel pipe shelters. You would need seven feet of dirt on top of a seven foot shelter. If you, if you do it correctly and put the crushed rock in correctly, then you get that huge blast protection. The installation is extremely important. You, you have to look at that depth of cover. Now, you may not feel like you need 150 PSI. You're not close enough to a blast, or maybe your water table is too high. But you've got to make sure that you don't get below into that water table. You have to have a dry hole, and you have to have an installation that's not going to be <clears throat> in an area where you're going to get a lot of water settling, like in a culvert or in, in a, on a hill that kind of comes down together it, you you can't you have to put it where you're not going to get runoff. Uh, you have to tr totally remove any clay that's in in that hole, and so you would if you had clay you'd want to remove all the clay and then beyond that by a couple of feet on each side and then you'd have to have new dirt come in, and you have to backfill with crushed rock, and uh, that crushed rock is uh, three quarter inch minus crushed rock and it's that clean crushed rock that they use in concrete. So here's, we've got a 10 foot diameter in this hole. The hole is 20 feet deep and we're pouring that crushed rock on the top off of, out of a, a big track hole. And you can't do this with a bobcat, so don't try. But the back hole pours it here and then it comes down on each side evenly all the way so that you don't load one side heavier than the other side. Because if you do, it will roll and it'll roll out of shape. So you have to very carefully fill it all the way over and back and forth until it's filled. 
this is almost filled at this point. You can see how they're filling and filling and filling. So this is a, a, a large family corrugated steel pipe shelter. I thought you'd like to maybe see some pictures of it. It's 12 foot diameter and 50 foot long. Uh, it has an entrance that's seven foot in diameter, but because of a large size entrance, it has to be very long. It has to be 26 feet long, where if you had a 48 or a 54 inch entrance, then it would only have to be maybe 15 feet long horizontally. And so um, it has some fairly wide halls inside. It has four feet of storage space under the floor. It's kind of a condo style. It might be a multifamily. And we build a few of these, but um, my favorite is a 10 foot. But I just thought I'd show you this just for fun. This is the bunk room. It had bunks on either end. This leads out to the entrance and this area is the bathroom. Uh, it had a nice size uh, area for a bedroom. It had a queen size bed and the kitchen on each side. Had a, a little kitchen table in there. Had the kitchen all the way across on both sides, the sink on one side and a prep area on the other and, uh, and a little uh, uh, sofa area. And then the ventilator was on this far end over here. So on these steel shelters, we, uh, on any kind of a shelter, I highly recommend that you don't skimp on your shelter, on your entrances, but put in two, two entrances and uh, they should have a, both a vertical and a horizontal leg to that entrance. So that properly attenuates the radiation. So if you have a vertical leg coming down, then 90% of that radiation, if it's a fairly slow, if a short, uh, I'm a small diameter, 90% of that radiation coming down will be lost. It just keeps going right on through into the ground and only 10% turns the corner. So when we're going horizontally with that 10%, then our formulas show that you lose almost all of that 10% horizontally before you get into the shelter. So um, if you're coming straight down on the top, then you're not going to have that 90%. It's just going to come right down on top of you. So, um, so a minimum between the vertical and the horizontal, we like to see a minimum of 22 feet. So that's the total of both the vertical and horizontal leg. And then of course, blast doors. So this uh, shelter, this 10 foot shelter has entrances on each side. So this one would be maybe a little wider. It might be the entrance and this might be the, the emergency exit. And uh, this is the plan view. So we're looking down on top of it. You can see how it comes out and then it turns up. And turning up, we want it to turn up at about a 60 degree angle in order to safely come up and down the stair ladder. And the same here, this one might be, a, uh, the emergency exit might be a vertical on this one, which is okay because you're not gonna be using that emergency exit uh, much, but a vertical entrance is kind of nice when you're lowering heavy things down into it, your sacks of grain and heavy things, it goes down a little easier if you have a vertical run there. <clears throat> this is a picture putting on a uh, an angled entrance and it's coming off of the end of a, of a corrugated steel pipe. You can see how it, the elbow comes and then the the uh, another vertical piece will go on top here and band together. So they're banding this now onto a little stub out. That stub out comes out about a foot. And, um, and so um, they'll band that with a gasket and again here until they get to grade. Now we put these corrugated steel pipe entrances on concrete shelters as well and on flat steel shelters as well. And uh, they're really nice because of the attenuation. They're the least expensive concrete. If you had to make that concrete uh, entrance like that, it would be extremely expensive. A lot of times we'll put these into basements of homes. And uh, so a corrugated steel pipe entrance, we're nearly always using those in concrete as well as steel design. The flat top shelters, however, you can't not put the same amount of dirt on top of a flat top shelter. It just won't hold it. That arch is the most, uh, is the strongest uh, geometry. So the flat top shelters, um, they, they have to really reinforce them heavily. And then that starts getting quite expensive. Uh, flat top shelters, of course, have the, the nice flat ends and, and, uh, and it's easier to put in, um, your, your furniture and your kitchens and things, but uh, uh, it, it's very difficult to get really good shielding and blast protection 
in them. This is a hatch door that we put on top of that corrugated steel pipe entrance. And once it's, it was flat like this, there's no drag from the blast winds. This is, a, we call it a little dog house because it covers our lock. We could have a little puck, uh, puck lock in there and, and it's been quite safe. And so uh, when we open that door, uh, then then uh, these lift assist opens and we do have these doors readily available in a number of companies that I've seen and I'm building them again now too. And then of course you enter here and down the staircase. Now this particular one is almost flush to the grade, but it does have a little bit of a drop. So water falls away from that on the concrete, but it's easier if you're not in a heavy blast zone to raise that just a little bit so you can sit on the side and then get in rather than kneel down and crawl in. This is the ladder, the, the stairs that come down from the top. So we're looking from the shelter up into the, into the upper part. The ventilation systems are extremely important. Uh, I like to have the steel pipes coming in uh, I like the uh, six or five inch schedule 40 steel pipe. And a lot of people say, well, why can't I put in PVC? Well, we don't want to fight a nuclear war with a plastic pipe. <clears throat> we really need to have a good, strong steel pipe. So um, this comes in at about seven or about six feet from the finished floor. And, and the air comes in here through a pre-filter, comes down here, and this is a metering device. So we really like the metering devices on these ventilators. They tell you how fast you can pull the, sh the air in. And, um, and when you're doing it manually, when you're working this manually, then it's important that you don't bring the air in too fast because then it has to have the, the right length of, of time in that chemical biological filtration area with the HEPA and the charcoal filter. This, it, in a chemical biological attack, this would, the clamp would come off and then this part goes here and this part goes here. And so then the air is forced down through here and up through here and the air exits here. There's a number of people that make these, uh, but they're all European. This one is made by Andair in Switzerland. Uh, Lua is about, it's almost exactly the same as eyes, but it has a design, but it has, they all have to have the same standard. And so there's a number of them that you can buy, but we feel like it's extremely important that they run electrically as well as manually. So you would turn this, now this, this nice big filter like this, you would, if you were doing this manually, each person would have about an hour a day on that manual pump in order to keep enough air in there for you to breathe properly. In the, the uh, smaller units, you have two hours a day. In the really small units, you would have four hours a day. So it gets a little cumbersome. But um, if you don't have alternative power running them, then you, you would do this manually. But alternative power is so important to us because after a nuclear event, we're not going to replenish that power. We're not going to replenish our gas for our generators or our diesel. And, and, uh, and we don't know, you know, if, if hopefully the solar systems will work, but will that solar system uh, be affected by EMP? Will we have our solar chargers and our and our inverters uh, not affected. And so if you're doing a solar system to run these kind of things and your lights, make sure that you carry some extra, an another set of inverters and, and uh, chargers. So uh, it does run electrically and manually, has the blast valves on each side. So this acts as a blast valve here. On the other end of the shelter, it will have another blast valve and as this positively pressurized the shelter, this other blast valve just breathes a little bit until it still keeps about 200 pascals of positive shelter pressure in there. And so uh, that always keeps that pressure. And then we want steel air vents. And then the HEPA and the charcoal filters. The pre-filter is very important. It picks up those larger pieces that are coming in. And so, um, it's all lab tested and, and does a beautiful job. Um, the, the air pipes, sometimes people want to hide those air pipes. And so sometimes we put fake rocks on them. This one has a bunch of holes on the other side and we just cover that air vent with, with a fake rock. 
and there's a number of uh, rocks that we can do, or a wishing well. You can cover your air vents like that. You can put them underground in what we call a rock crib, but we've had um, people flood their shelters with those rock cribs because a runoff has come and filled the crib and then it fills the shelter. So I prefer to have the vents above grade by about two feet. So the furnishers, furnishings for the blast shelter, we want, if they're a true blast shelter, we want hammocks instead of bunks. Because in a hammock, uh, you would want to protect your cell from the sides of the shelter and from the floor of the shelter. There's enough blast in 150 PSI that you could break your legs on the bottom of your shelter, or it could push you against the side of your shelter because it, there's such a, a, a terrific movement. And so <clears throat> you can do hammock chairs, hammock, uh, uh, hammocks folded and, and uh, lightweight folding tables and underfloor storage or separate storage area. So this is the hammocks. <clears throat> And so if there were, if we were expecting a heavy blast, we would, we would uh, put out our hammocks. And if there were an EMP warning, everyone would go to the shelter and they would get in their hammock until the, the threat they failed of blast had passed. But an EMP could be a pretty good indicator that a blast is imminent. So if you're in a blast zone, then this is, and you have a blast shelter, you would want to get some hammocks. But most of the people, I truly believe that most of the people will survive those weapons effects and, and they will die from, from disease and not having food and not having water. So the important, the really important thing that you need to do before even your sheltering is make sure that you provided the water and food that you need. So the space requirements, you wanna have a one year supply of food, and clothing and, and storage. 100 days of water, now that's not easy. 55 gallon drums of water, we usually put 55 gallon drums down there. And, and I like to have a 55 gallon drum for every person that's in there. So if I had a 24 person shelter, I'd put 24 drums down there of water or, or maybe the 30 inch ones. In a 10 foot diameter, I can put 30 inch, at, I'm sorry, uh, 30 gallon water tank uh, uh, barrels under the floor and then 88 cubic feet of free airspace per person. So here, Paul is putting some storage underneath his floor. All of this floor lifts up so that he can get down there and, and utilize that two feet of floor underneath the shelter's floor. And here he has uh, water barrels under there, the 30 gallon water barrels. Sanitation facilities. We, we, we recommend chemical toilets. Um, we recommend a private area, gray water drains, uh, adequate storage for human waste, but you can put in a flush toilet. You can pump them by foot, but every flush of that toilet is going to take a day's supply of drinking water. I mean, uh, uh, for one person. So, you know, it can take a gallon to flush it and, and your drinking water is a gallon. And so you have to have plentiful water to have a flush toilet and, and shower is the same thing. We, we put showers in some of them, but people that have wells that some of them hand pump the wells, if they're sure that that uh, pump is EMP hardy and they're going to have plenty of water, then we can put in a flush toilet. But we still recommend that they back that up with chemical toilets and storage for, for uh, the human waste. The lighting, we like to use low amperage lights. You can use LED lights, but they may be vulnerable to EMP, those little LEDs. Um, we want to have them vibration and shock resistant and a redundant light sources, whatever, you know, whatever their other light sources you have are so important. And then standalone power source. And so this little light comes down on this. Sorry about that. This little light comes down on this cord. And we had this all ready and the inspectors came in and cut off all the lights of that shelter. <laughs> and these are just little DC lights. And so we were so mad at them that they didn't understand that this is what gave it the blast protection. Because if there were a heavy blast, this shelter, this uh, a wall could come in as much as two inches 
and it would uh, it would uh, destroy this little light. So in that shelter that was quite close to an Air Force base, we wanted to have these little uh, lights hanging down so that they wouldn't be uh, destroyed in the blast. So again, um, alternative power systems, we should use low amperage lights with it, but batteries, uh, deep cycle RV or gel cell, I much prefer the gel cell or the um, glass mat over the deep cycle because the gel cell and the glass mat have a much longer life. Um, the LED, um, uh, I mean, the, the lithium batteries, um, I'm still not quite trusting of them. And I assume that they're EMP hardy, but um, I know they have, you know, you can just keep charging them forever, but you have so many connections in the lithium batteries and a lot of them are built outside of the country in China or someplace else. And, and uh, we have to be able to, if one goes out, you have to replace all of them. So I really like the gel cell and the, and the little uh, glass mat. Uh, generators, we would never put a gasoline generator or a propane generator into a shelter. Uh, they have to be outside. Um, diesel generators can go into concrete shelters, but you have to have them separated from the living space with an airlock. And some of these uh, steel shelter designers are putting the generators into their steel shelters. You cannot, it's, I, it might not be impossible, but it would be very difficult to um, isolate the generator in a steel shelter from the rest of the shelter. So you're looking at CO2 issues that are very insidious. And so I prefer not to put generators inside shelters. And outside, uh, anything that's below ground, you want to make sure that it's diesel and not propane because the specific gravity of, um, of diesel and, and gasoline is greater than air and, and that would be an issue. Solar panels are great. Um, we kind of put out sacrificial solar panels if we're in a blast area and we would put the rest of the solar panels inside or someplace where they're protected against blast. Uh, water and wind generators would be great if you have them stored inside and you can put them outside after. Uh, this is a generator shelter. You can see that uh, it's about, uh, I think this was an eight or a nine foot diameter. We lined all of the floor with steel because you're always going to have spills onto that wood floor and then that becomes a fire danger. Uh, this lifts uh, lifts up, but really not for storage because you can see how close this is on our and on our living shelters, these are two feet apart, but this has to be so close in order to carry the heavy weight of the generators. These are uh, farm tanks and the entrance comes down because we don't care if that generator gets gamma radiation, it's not gonna hurt it. So we put the generator uh, shelter in, in a shelter where we can just put a ladder down here and we can come in and take care of the shelter. But this would pretty well be a post-war situation when you're coming in to take care of generators. Uh, these are the batteries. We would have probably 16 in a shelter that's about a 10 by 50. So what is new and what is not? And um, our new concerns are solar EMP. Now, I don't know if you're aware that there's been quite a few solar flares this past week, and I don't know how bad they are, but uh, th that solar EMP is a huge threat, and it could take out our power grid as easy as EMP could. And the failure of government, we, we haven't talked about that so much in years past, but 30 years ago, we started to talk about failures of government. And the design principles that some of the shelter, the shelter companies are putting in, EMP hardening of generators, uh, showers, flush toilets, washers, dryers, TVs, refrigerators. Uh, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. How are they going to have a washer and a dryer in their shelter with all the humidity that it's gonna provide? And, and again, all of the water it would take. And if you have to, if, if you have to repair your washer and dryer, how are you gonna get them out? So we highly recommend that this new development of putting all of these fancy things into the shelter is not done, that, that you keep it simple. TVs, refrigerators, that all should be simple. You could put a small refrigerator in there for peacetime use, but uh, don't depend on it for, for afterwards. And the very large diameters, those 12 foot diameter shelters, 
They're very difficult to install. They're very expensive to make. They're probably twice the expense of a 10 foot shelter and you don't get that much more for it. You don't get that much more usable space. Four feet under the floor of storage in the 12 foot shelter, you do get more storage, but you have to get down inside of it to organize it and find anything. Where if you have two feet or three feet of storage under the three feet in the 10 foot shelter, you can just reach down there and organize it. So we highly recommend shelters that are 10 foot or under and that you don't put all these fancy things in them. And the little seven foot corrugated steel pipe shelters, you don't even have to have a floor in those at all. That it kind of limits the storage space, but you can make them longer. But uh, you can put a bed in one end and, a, and the ventilator in the other end and they're quite inexpensive. So that's basically we have to be very careful what we ask for. So if you're asking for if you're asking for washers and dryers, you're going to get you're you're going to have trouble. Design to your threat and means, and and uh, it would be wonderful. I wish every one of us could have a hardened blast shelter, but we're not all going to need it if we're not in a blast zone, and we're not going to be able to afford it. Uh, a lot of us. So design to your threat and economically to your means. Prepare carefully and do it now. And so I've left enough time, about 15 minutes, that we can have questions now and we can revisit any part of this uh, that you would like. And um, so I'll open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions for Sharon? There is a question in the chat okay. that I'll read to you. It says, we are building a shelter right now. The shelter is not going to be ideal due to financial and building code constraints. It will be a 16 foot by 15 foot concrete block shelter. The entrance will be three feet with a 90 degree angle than the stairs to the entrance. The entry door is going to be a heavy duty security door. Do you think putting concrete blocks into the hall would be necessary to increase PF? The shelter will have four feet of dirt. Okay, so four feet of dirt, and if it's only a three foot diameter entrance, how long was that horizontal run again, did they say? There's like, there's something blocking part of it, so I can't read it, but it says the entrance will be three feet. I'm assuming that's the uh -huh. It might be typo, I'm not sure. With a 90 degree angle, then something's blocked. The stairs to the surface. Uh -huh. Okay. And so uh, if that hall is long enough, if it's uh, 12 or 15 feet long, then you don't need to block the other side of the entrance. So as you come in, whether you're coming down or in from the side, you come in, then, then if it's a little too short, then you can put a block in front of it so that you have to enter around that block entrance. So you wanna make sure that that entrance is, that's where most of the radiation will come from, from the entrance. Karen, can you hear me? Uh huh. Okay. Uh, I will be going to Switzerland. Oh, wonderful. Uh, at some point. And, you know, I've been reading about it for years and I'm well aware of how far ahead of us that they are. Can you recommend an organization or a person there that I can contact before I go so that I can uh, find out about how they do it there? Well, uh, when Paul and I went to Switzerland, we went a, about uh, three or four days before our husbands, uh, before my husband and his wife came. And so we just toured as much as we could. And every place we go, could we'd say, can we see your shelter? And they'd say, why do you want to see that? Well, we're from America. We don't have any shelters. <laughs> and so they they always let us down. And you can say, I am I belong to the American Civil Defense Association and, and I would love to see your shelter. So I don't know that every person is in their organization. They don't have a special organization. 
every right. person carries a gun. You know, all of the men carry a gun. They go in in their little cities. Every person has a dedicated bed in a shelter. They they uh, refurbish their shelters every year. They they change out the medicine in their hospital shelters and they paint them and they clean them. And so every person is in that civil defense organization. So any place you go, whether it's a theater, whether it's a commercial building, whether it's a hospital, whether it's any place, uh, they showed us. I'm assuming that they would show you too. Where, where oh, that's you great to hear. So you're saying you didn't even contact anyone before you went. Uh -uh, you just went no, but and then course, asked as you were there. Okay. Yeah. But of course, All we right. had and Dare that we were talking to too. And they took us into the military shelters, which was really fun. But I don't think. Wow get into military shelters, but Andair took us. And then they said, just go around and look at them. And every place we went, and, and literally every place where shelters, uh -huh. and most homes have them. And if they don't, they have a public shelter within just a very short distance. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank and, you. And other countries as well. We're so far behind. And oh, the yeah. only way we're going to get them is to demand that we get them because we get what we ask for if our if the leaders of our uh, of our government they don't hear what we want then they're going to give you know what they think will get them reelected so we have to voice loudly that we want a shelter program and maybe someday we'll get one but the government is not being upfront with us either they're not telling us the real threat and they're not telling us about their beautiful shelters either. <laughs> well, there is an Air Force general that's uh, warning us every day that the CCP is going to move in Taiwan soon. So, and uh, I, I take his word; he's a good general. Yeah. Well, and and they some of them will will tell us the threat, but they're not saying, "Hey, guys, go out and get a shelter," or "Hey, we'll give you a good tax deduction for it." So right. I don't know. I just don't know what the answer is. We've been trying for thirty years. And longer. I mean, six, 1962. Years. <laughs> that just started trying. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Someone wants to know what is the average pricing on things like this? Okay, so uh, concrete shelters. Um, the concrete is really expensive. It's more expensive than steel. But yeah. a lot of people can do their own construction. And so that limits the expense. But a great big 12 footer like I was showing you earlier, which is really overkill, but no, that that's what they wanted. But uh, that 12 footer probably by the time you get it um, trans transported to you and installed, because installation on the 12 footer would cost 15, 20,000. It would be, you know, 150, 180,000, maybe more. But the 10 footers are going to be considerably less. Seven footers, if you will do the work yourself, uh, X factory, we can get for about 30,000, the little seven foot shelters, but you still have to put in a ventilator and doors, but, uh, but about 30,000 will get the tank and the entrances and the entrance uh, stub outs and, and all the gaskets and everything, maybe even less 28,000, something like that. But you, you have to put in, you know, you don't need a floor, but you'd have to put in, you'd have to install your own ventilator and, and do a little work on it. Question by Mark. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> what would you say about um, concrete pipe or a, a shelter? Um, well, if it's reinforced, but I, I don't know if they do reinforce the concrete pipe. Um, it's, it's hard to get an entrance on it um, because if you put the entrance on the side, you've got that, that curb on it. If you put a concrete wall on the end, you could still put a corrugated steel pipe entrance on it by putting a, um, a flange around the pipe and then bolting the, the, um, the flange into that concrete, um, um, but the the little concrete septic tank. Somebody said they wanted to use that, um, and uh, I think they they won't give you the protection that a good rebar concrete will. But they certainly would. Uh, septic tanks are fairly close to the surface too. They don't have a lot of 
covered because we just we need to clean them. So a uh, septic tank fails at about five psi. But if you were able to get a concrete tank a little deeper, that I I would need a I have a good civil engineer look at the concrete and and the design of the concrete before I could recommend it. Also, um, how long would it, you expect a a steel uh, structure to to last? I mean, you know, it's made of uh, what is it? Can't can't think of what. Anyway, uh, the layers galvanized. Uh -huh. It's galvanized. And galvanized. Perfect. Uh huh. Uh, we just dug up one that we'd had in the ground. We we didn't dig it up, but it been in the ground for twenty five years because we wanted to put in a, a. It was just a storage shelter, and we wanted to put in a ventilator in it. And it was as shiny as when we put it in. I could still see the writing on the sides. But if you're running water through a corrugated steel pipe, then then um, you're going to get electrolysis, and you're going to have uh, uh, rusting. But we're not putting water through our corrugated steel pipe, and we're not putting it in the water table. So there's really no reason for the galvanized corrugated steel pipe to deteriorate. So I think we will get decades out of them. We've had some Thank of you. our for quite a long time, and they're not showing any sign of rust or, or deteriorating. But you have to be careful that you don't weld on the sides. Uh, somebody put in one of the corrugated steel pipes uh, shelters and um, instead of bolting the the uh, floor to the to the bottom, they they welded a piece along the bottom, and uh, and the welding burned off the galvanizing. And in five years, that's going to rust out. That's going to weaken it, and it's going to split. So don't weld on the corrugated steel pipe. You can only weld on the end where you don't have the corrugations. So the end, you know, you can put a good good heavy steel plate on the ends, but uh, don't weld anything against the sides because those corrugations are about every three inches. And then you can only weld about every three inches and it just isn't strong and it, and it weakens the structure. I know a lot of the, uh, some of the uh, steel plate people really fuss about corrugated steel pipe, but the only pipe that I have ever seen rust out is the water pipes. And, and even then, you know, and you look at earthquakes all over Alaska, they're not replacing those corrugated steel pipes. They, they've got thousands of feet, tens of thousands of feet of corrugated steel pipe all over Alaska, and they're not replacing them. They're just fine on years and years and years of service. Great, thank you. We have a question from Gatlin. It says, I have two questions. How long would alpha particles linger after nuclear war? And should people shelter in place or evacuate if a commercial nuclear power plant had a disaster? Good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, the, uh, first of all, the, the power plants, uh, if there's a disaster there, and you know, we're, we're downwind of that, we're really looking at an issue with iodine-131. And the iodine has a half-life of about um, nine days. And so after 90 days, then you've got 10 half-lives and it's no longer an issue. 10 half-lives of anything. So iodine-131, you'd want to keep, if you're any place near a power plant like that, you wanna make sure you're keeping iodine, that that uh, uh, iodine pills, the, uh, uh, the potassium iodide or iodate. I think we still have some uh, for sale at TACT. Are we still selling that, Roseanne? Yes. That. And so it would be really good to have that on hand. Um, and and any of them you would, that are near any kind of a threat, um, the iodine is important. Alpha and beta particles do have a long shell, you know, they have a long half-life. Uh, some of the betas are very short, like, like the iodine-131, but they have a much longer life than the gamma. The gamma is gone, uh, much of the gamma is gone after about uh, two weeks. But the betas and gammas, I mean, the betas and alphas, they, they deteriorate and they cause a gamma also. So that's just all part of the same issue. But um, we want to make sure in our post-war preparations that we know what kind of things we can eat um, because we're not going to outlive the life of those alpha particles and those beta particles. They're going to be long, long 
there after we're dead and gone. And so um, even the next year after harvest, you you can uh, right right after harvest, you can you can dig up potatoes and peel them and eat them. You can peel carrots. You can peel apples. Uh, you, you can uh, anything that has a hard uh, uh, skin on it. You can wash it or peel it. But strawberries and raspberries, you know, they, I wouldn't be eating those, <laughs> and and uh, because they would have fallout on them. But the alphas and betas, they do work their way down into the soil after a while with all of the rain and the and and the weathering. But um, <clears throat> for the first couple of years, you probably don't want to to plant um, uh, calcium, high calcium producing food, um, because. Um, the calcium looks very much like um, um, protein. Yeah, and like what's the other one? But anyway, the bones, the bones want calcium, and they can't tell the difference between that and strontium ninety. And so strontium is going to go right to your bone. And so um, if if the calcium producing foods pick up the strontium instead of the calcium because they don't care what it is, it looks the same and it gets into our body, then we're, it's going to go to our bones. So be careful that you're not eating food that has grown on an uh, area where there's a lot of fallout that, that might produce calcium. Um, and um, uh, uh, fish are, are good. You can eat fish if they're uh, the top feeders. You don't want to eat carp and, and uh, catfish because they're bottom feeders because those alphas and betas are on particles and they will go to the bottom of the pond. Um, uh, eggs, you can eat eggs. Uh, it's it, the, any radiation will be in the shells, so the inside of the egg is fine. Um, any any animal that isn't sick, uh, you can slaughter and still eat as long as it's not showing sickness. Uh, but you don't want to eat the organs; you only eat the meat and strip the meat from the bones because they may have been foraging on areas where power the the uh, iodine one thirty one could have been falling, and they could have eaten it and and it could be a problem to you, but you have to watch what you eat and wash things and be very careful to wash any wounds and keep it out of your eyes. But um, uh, I think after two or three weeks in almost all places, we can come out and start living. And and again, if you're in an area where you don't see a lot of dust coming, you, you don't have fallout. Fallout looks like dust. And, and um, so if you're having you know, quarter of inch of dust falling, you're, you're getting fallout and it, it could be significant amounts of fallout. But if you don't have any dust falling, then you probably don't have much fallout. But I would highly recommend that you get some kind of a metering device so you know. So the low rate dosimeters and meters that read in millirenkins, and we've got an article on this at uh, this time in our journal, but the millirenkins is not a whole lot of good during a wartime situation, but post-war situation, you want to know if your food is contaminated and you can find that out with your little, uh, with your little millirenkin meters and, and dosimeters. But the, the uh, high rate meters uh, up to 200 renkins or, or rads, they're basically the same when you're looking at that nuclear um, uh, event, then, then, the dosimeter should read at least to 200 rads and the meter should read to 500 rads. And so we have a penalty chart coming out in our in our journal that's just about ready to come, a uh, penalty chart and, and uh, some information on dosimeters. And we're carrying the dosimeters now in the tap to store. They're hard to find and Roseanne was able to search out and find some high rate dosimeters for us so that we can purchase those. Thank you. We have another question by Stephen. He says, do shelters need to be underground? I live in Houston and we're very close to sea level. Okay, so shelters can be above ground. And I wonder if we can find that. Um, I don't know if we can go back far enough to find that. But the above ground shelters had to have some massive amounts of concrete or dirt. And uh, if they're not too high, then you can cover them with the dirt. Um, but um, if you're going above ground and you're and maybe you've got a concrete shelter and you had to add some dirt to the outside and over the top and make a hill over it, 
then you want to make sure if you're in a blast zone that it doesn't go more than 30 degrees, that it you keep that slope of the dirt to under 30 degrees, 30 degrees or under, because the blast winds will walk up over that and tornadoes, they'll walk up over that um, that slope and, and otherwise they'll just, um, they'll blow the dirt away and then you've lost your, uh, then you've lost your shielding. So I think we're almost there maybe. It was towards the front of our, of our lecture. Almost, maybe, <laughs> sorry, about this has taken a long time. Okay, that was, so see this D2 here? 31 inches on D1 and 22 inches on D2. And so if you, and then if you had it a little thinner and you put a dirt a mound up over that, you know, you want to keep those, that dirt at a real nice slope. So maybe you can go partially under the ground and then, and then put the dirt mound over the top, but you still want to get your entrance at an angle. But you can do this if you have enough concrete. What about um, shelters inside your home? What if you don't have room to build something in your yard? Okay, and so if you're, if you have a basement, then, uh, you can certainly build the shielding around you in a basement. You look at the the uh, uh, the corner that has the most dirt cover on the outside and it's away from windows or windows you can protect. And then you want to get shielding from the bottom up. It's a little hard to, uh, some people have tried to put shielding into their ceiling, uh, but that ceiling hasn't been designed to carry that kind of a load. So I would worry about it, but you can build from the bottom up if you have massive, um, uh, four by fours and, and, and you're holding up uh, another ceiling and put, uh, put shielding over the top of that sandbags or whatever, or if you have a heavy, heavy table and, and you put uh, uh, shielding over the table and around it and try to get a little angle going into that still, even still. But if you're in a basement, you can do that. Upstairs, you want to shield in the inner part of your, your home, keep it away from as many areas that have windows and doors as you can, um, place as much shielding as you can around you. And in low radiation areas, people are going to survive if they just get minimum amount of shielding. So just put whatever you can. I would, I would pull up everything I could find to put around an area whether it's mattresses, couches, books, everything you can to, to pull that around. And especially if you have water storage, that little water shelter we talked about with water bricks, if you have a, a garage, you could fill your water bricks early and, and build your little shelter out of water bricks and then put them on top of, of the heavy little uh, uh, covering that you have. But if you have to sit under there for two weeks, you're safe. You know, it wouldn't be comfortable, but that you would survive. And so uh, look at getting shielding wherever you can. George wants to know, what is the distance from ground zero in your shelter examples? Uh, from ground zero, it was about a half mile. Let's see. Yeah, it was a quarter mile from the crater edge and a half mile from ground zero in a one megaton weapon. So that would give about 200 PSI. They've told us that we'll we'll survive at 200. I like to say 150, but if you sit against the wall, you're not going to survive. If you're standing on the floor, you're not going to survive because those doors, those floors and walls and ceiling will come in two or three inches at, at, at an acceleration that could kill you or break your legs. So you have to, if you're close like that, you have to be able to get in a hammock to survive that kind of blast. And the doors, the hatch doors have to be protected from the thermal pulse. So if you are doing a shelter like that, you want to consult us so we can tell you how to protect your steel doors because uh, your steel hatch doors, uh, they will burn also. But it's such a fraction of a, of a minute, it, it's just seconds that that thermal pulse will burn. And so you put a sacrificial cover of wood over your steel door and the wood burns, but then the steel doesn't. 
So there's things that we can do, but if you're that close, you probably would have to have the um, the rock cribs where your your steel air uh, air pipe is below grade and rocks are on top of it. And we can show you how to build those um, rock cribs. But then of course you have to protect it close uh, from from water invasion. But those are the ways we protect the uh, the shelter in high blast areas. And we were told this by the engineers at the Nevada test site, they tested these concepts. They tested the corrugated steel pipe shelters. They, I don't know how we were so fortunate, but they gave us every formula, every design, none of it was classified. They just handed it to us. And so we know that all that has been tested under actual blast and radiation conditions. There's a question about iodine from Steve. I recently saw mentioned that for people over age 60, taking iodine after an event is not needed. Any comments on that? Uh, it's, it's probably not recommended either. Um, I I think that it probably, it would be so slow growing that, uh, you know, that it may not be an issue. If you're real healthy, maybe you'd want to anyway, I don't know. But um, the iodine, you, you certainly don't be want to be taking it now in case you think there might be a blast. Wait until, you know, that's a medicine and you don't want to be taking it all the time. But um, if you have thyroid problems, you don't want to take it. And, and uh, you probably ought to consult your, your uh, doctor if you're over 60. I don't know that I would. I don't think I would take the iodine. Okay, from Peter. Does it need to be planted at a certain depth to protect the root vegetables from fallout? Um, the root vegetables, I don't think that it, it matters. Uh, you're going to, uh, even if they're outside and gathered some fallout, you can still wash them and, and, uh, and peel them. So uh, I think that you're fine. But if I were going to plant them the next year, I'd want to make sure that I had cleared the ground and, and uh, had a, uh, 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 maybe six inches of topsoil pushed off so that I could get to cleaner ground. But um, if they're calcium producing like broccoli, things like that, then you might want to wait to plant that. Oh. Okay. Let's see. Does anyone else have a question? There's a I few know we're beyond here. our hour, so I'm happy to stay, but I know some of you are yeah, we don't have a lot of time. I, I'd, I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Certainly. So, hi, Sharon. It's Douglas Clark. We've we've talked in the past. Yes, Douglas. In um, On some of the larger projects that we end up contracting for, and we review documents, there there is an ongoing professional dispute on the minimum square foot per occupant for the larger shelters with longer time frame planning. You know, they're not little 72 hours. We're, we're looking at weeks in a shelter internment and we're looking at dozens of people. Um, so there seems to be some disagreement on the minimum livable square footage between what FEMA guidelines are and what building codes have to say about habitable spaces. Where do you weigh in on that? How, what, I, I, and, and this is a non-binding communication type thing. Let's let's just kind of open the, the topic. Sure. And uh, I I I don't know if you were involved in that uh, very large shelter for uh, is just 30, 32 people, and but it was very very large. And the problem that we have, you know, they want a place where they can can survive and live after the event, and um, after the event, you're not going to, your alternative energy is going to be at a minimum. And so if you were forced at some time during that two weeks or three weeks or later to run manually the enough air to uh, positively pressurize that shelter, you don't have enough manpower. So in the larger shelters where they want to have something large like that, I recommend, and, and often they will do that, I recommend that they have a, a smaller space dedicated to the, the highest um, risk time. So they might have two or three bedrooms with a bathroom 
that they could close off with gas tight doors where they have uh, enough manpower to run the ventilators within that area. Most of our big shelters have a, a, um, a, a room where we have all of the ventilators and then they come, the air comes through big vents through the shelter. So in order to run those ventilators, you have to run all of the ventilators. In those big shelters, I recommend that we put one or two of the smaller VA-150s because one VA-150 would be fine for 30 people. And you have a smaller area because you can't have more than 150, 200 meter cubed to pressurize an area against the um, chemical biological. So that's why I say, let's build it as big as they want. But if you're going to have to use the chemical biological filters, dedicate smaller areas that you could run manually if you had to. So like a, like a, a dormitory subset yes. that would be for, for the first at least 72 hours to get past the, the seven hours plus the 48 hours. We, we well, get out in of two weeks, uh -huh. if they've got, if, if they're worried about chem bio and that chem bio might last longer than uh, seven or 10 days, the gamma radiation probably won't unless there's uh, continual explosions. But, but I, I recommend that they get an area that they can manually run. Maybe their maybe their alternative energy system will run it, and they can stay in the whole shelter. But um, I would I would dedicate an area that they could run themselves for two or three weeks that they manually can handle. Now you have 150 people in these big shelters, then they can do it. But um, but when you have minimum manpower, you've got to look at that potential of having to do this manually you can't depend on on your alternative energy agreed yeah. and this has been uh, thought out before if you look into greenbrier in west uh virginia it, it'd be judging by your question it'd be worthwhile for you to research greenbrier it's all public now uh -huh. so uh yeah. if you look into raven rock and if you look into greenbrier uh some of your questions might be answered uh-huh Thank you. Okay, one more question. What is the best filter for ventilation? Uh, you have to, I, you really need both a HEPA and a charcoal filter. The charcoal really is uh, uh, designed more for the chemicals and the HEPA more for the biologicals. Um, the, the chemical threat is, is fairly low for the general public. And so the HEPA might be enough for the for the other, but but uh, I recommend something that will have both. And uh, you have to have heavy, heavy rubber piping that's been designed and tested against those chemicals. And it's hard here in America to test against those because we don't have access to them. Where in Europe and Switzerland in particular, the military tests them and they have access and know exactly the molecular sizes they have to test against and they know how to test it. So they have to have the correct paint within that filter canister that's not going to react with the chemicals. Every part of it has to, the, the HEPA filter has to be folded in such an exact way that it touches every part of that canister. So it's very hard for us to build a good filtration system in America without those testing facilities. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, if there are any questions that we missed, feel free to email info at tacta.org and I will forward those questions to Sharon and see if we can get them answered for you. So Sharon, thank you so much for it your was time and effort. My pleasure. Your, the information that you've provided has been totally invaluable for everybody. Yes, thank you very much. You're so very welcome. Great job, Sharon. Sure. Thank you as always. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, thank you everyone you. for coming. We'll see you next month. And watch for your journal. Watch for your <laughs> journal. The journal comes out in October. This was great, thank you guys. Have a thank great you. night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night.